I think there's just something about the woods and rivers that just makes you feel very connected to the mysterious and unknowable. Hello, salut, bonjour. Welcome to The Lost Bay, a show about indie RPG creators and artists and what's behind their creative processes. I'm Iko. Today, my guest is Yohai Gal, creator of Cairn, a very rules light RPG game of forest fantasy inspiration. The book has straightforward rules and really beautiful illustrations. Cairn was released in October 2020 as a PDF on each IO, and it's now available as a printed book from different stores. You'll find the links to those stores in the show notes or on my blog. Cairn was released for free and under a Creative Commons license. Yohai is a strong believer in free culture, and as a matter of fact, in Yohai own words, Cairn is a mashup of two other games released under a Creative Commons license, Nave by Ben Milton and Into the Odd by Chris McDowell. The impetus was um, I wanted to use uh, Into the Odd, basically, the system Into the Odd by Chris McDowell. I wanted to use that system with um, the very popular Dolmenwood setting by Gavin Norman um, of Necrotic Gnome Games, which um, I absolutely adore, not just because it uses a real forest fantasy, fairy, British Isles um, mythology in it, but because it creates new ones as well. And it does it so perfectly. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of uh, some of the older versions of D&D or the more recent versions in terms of the mechanics. I find them to be maybe a little too crunchy for me. And I thought, let's create a version of Into the Odd that is uh, a little more traditional fantasy, but with a focus on a setting close to the Dolmenwood uh, environment you can find in the Wormskin zines that uh, Gavin Norman put out, which I own all of them in print. I love them thematically and um, structurally. I think they're the, probably the best laid out RPG modules I've seen aside from some of the more recent Mothership stuff. You know, if there was just some version of Into the Odd that was fantasy-based, you could do that. And, and there is. There's a couple. Um, the most notable is the very, very excellent Into the Dungeon Revived, which is awesome, and I've run it a bunch of times, but it doesn't have the same sort of um, thematic or narrative focus that I prefer. So Into the Odd has spawned many of these kinds of fantasy hacks. All I did was synthesize two game systems that are already excellent in and of themselves and um, kind of connect them with a, a theme of kind of dark forest fantasy, which is something that I like. Cairn is essentially a rule set. It comes with tables, four characters, gear, a hundred spells, and a very simple bestiary of six monsters. But we'll come back to that later because Yohai is working on a new super interesting bestiary project right now. So, there isn't really a setting in the book, and nonetheless, it has a very strong foresty and mysterious feel. And this is no coincidence, because Yohai lives literally next door to the forest. We did this interview over a Zoom call, and at some point, he just tilted the webcam of his computer, and the forest was there, just behind the window, a few steps from his house, all covered in snow. Uh, I have a three-year-old. And every day I, I take him from school at three into the forest near our home for two to three hours. It's not a hike, though. We just go through the forest. You know, we go to the vernal pool. We go to the very top of the mountain and look down. Or we find little spots that we pretend are caves of mystery. And, and when we do this together, sometimes we do this with our neighbors. It's a big part of living where I live is it's surrounded by a forest. And... Um, and it's true. When I was young, and my father, you know, who will never understand this being raised in the deserts of southern Israel, he cannot understand. I, I always fantasized about, like, what I thought the English countryside looked like. I think there's just something about the woods and rivers and even now in the snow that just makes you feel very connected to the mysterious and unknowable. And, and so I find that very appealing. And I'm not alone. A lot of people feel that way. Um, it just took a long time for me to find a way to express that. And, and I, I'm a fan of 
horror to some degree, especially um, written horror, especially kind of weird fiction. And um, a lot, it uses a lot of that. And a lot of times I, I will be reading something, even something that isn't based in the forest, and I'll interpret it through that lens. It's a, it's a familiar setting that a lot of fantasy comes out of. Like I, I have this book here, um, this Alan Lee and um, Brian Froud fairies book. You know, it's maybe 90% forest, but they don't really even show trees, but you just get the sense that there is so much hidden, unknowable darkness, you know? And I, I, I could talk about the desert the same way, uh, but it just never called to me, you know? And I always told people when I lived elsewhere, I always said, like, I want to live in, the, in, in New England because I visited here once and really loved how the rivers and towns were so close to each other and the forest was every nature insists itself upon people here or it did you know before people moved out west and i always dreamed of living here and then everyone said you know you're going to go out there and you're going to miss things about other places you've lived and they're wrong i don't <laughs> i don't it just totally satisfies me even the winters you know so yeah i think um there's something magical about the forest and unknowable and I hope if people ever develop settings specifically for Cairn, that they kind of um, can help reproduce that. Not because I care about it being consistent, but because I want more of it, you know? The art cover of Cairn is a black and white illustration. It represents a bush, quite a chaotic bush, or maybe a cave entrance uh, made of brambles and thorns. And at the bottom of the drawing, there's a crown hanging from a branch. And a couple of hands are trying to get out of the ground through the thorns. It's extremely evocative, like all the art in the book. I actually would start with the art first. Like I have a folder of public domain art that I call ready, which means people can just take it. And um, this one is actually my favorite. It's, it's from oldbookillustrations.com. And um, it's a girl on a bird, which for some reason feels forest fantasy to me. I actually think... The feeling people get from the book is way more to do with the art than it is the words. And I can't take any credit for that. Um, so yeah, it's from there. I mean, I edited some of it pretty heavily. Like the, the inside cover art is the Marsh King from um, a Hans Christian Andersen story. And uh, I sort of cut out this naked woman that was in that picture. And I reversed the Marsh King and kind of made it fit. The cover art is also public domain. Although the original design of having the word cairn inside of this um, white box, that was put together by Cosmic or Orrery. The only um, original art is this amazing character sheet by Licopeo, which is um, Francesco Zanieri, who's an Italian artist. A lot of the character sheet was designed in tandem with me. Like I, I sent him a really crappy box version of this backpack and said I want check boxes for the hand and and he just did it like that's actually what's more incredible about his art is not how good it is but that he listened to my micromanaging and then just did what I wanted um that was kind of amazing Cairn comes with a set of principles both for the wardens and the players and by the way Yohai calls the DM or referee warden these principles are a set of guidelines that define a gaming style. They are written in a very concise fashion. Uh, right in Cairn, Yohai was looking for a system that encouraged and allowed exploration and emergent narrative, critical thinking. But a few years ago, he was playing a very different style of games, story-oriented games. So I ran Dungeon World, which is a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Uh, one, by the way, which is seemingly hated by many people and yet is extremely popular. One of the things that I really struggled with when running Dungeon World was this idea of being a fan of the characters, which I like on a, from a story perspective, but I think mechanically in the game translates to people never dying. And when people don't die, they don't avoid combat as much. And when they don't avoid combat as much, they don't think as critically. I really like critical thinking and problem solving in, in games. And Dungeon World, for the 500 times or so I ran it, really never gave me the feeling of a game that people can solve problems within a story by critical thinking. It, um, they might use... Um, certain mechanics to emulate a genre really, really well. Like I think 
Apocalypse World style games are really good at um, emulating specific genre. You know, if you want to be teenage uh, monsters in messy relationships, post-apocalyptic warriors, whatever, it's really good at that. But the flip side is that it's very mechanically heavy. And it makes sense. I mean, that's how they achieve those genre expectations. When I discovered Into the Odd, there was this kind of like, uh-oh moment where I realized I would never want to play any other game again. Not that I would never want to play any game that isn't Into the Odd, but I I never want to run a game like the Black Hack or like Knave that has six stats. doesn't interest me. And there are some amazing games out there, even games that I'll buy and read that have the six core attributes. And I just, to me, that's like, I'm never going to, I know I'll never run it. I just, I never want to ask someone to make a perception check or to discern realities. I, I, I don't want to reward people with story and fictional elements based on the a, a, a dice rolls. I, I want them to achieve those things by interacting with the world. I really like problem solving. I really like critical thinking. I really like when the fiction flows naturally from the um, experiences of the characters in the world as if it was a real place. Uh, and I found not that many games could do both of those things. Like, I think Into the Odd can do most of that really, really well, especially Electric Bastion Land, which just takes it to the next level. Um, but thematically, Electric Bastion Land isn't designed for running old school modules. You know, there's no spells. For me, having the players have ultimate information about a situation, ultimate with it respect to what's possible. I mean, they're not going to have... Uh, they're not psychic, but they, they don't have omniscience, but they do um, act intelligently and the GM has a responsibility of providing information to them so that they can then make uh, reasonable decisions and use critical thinking and problem solving to get out of their problems. Because that's what storytelling is, in my opinion. It's problem solving. It's how do the people that we care about in a, in a movie or a book, how do they get out of whatever situation they're in? You know, if, if nothing was happening, it wouldn't be interesting if there was no problems to solve. And so to me, if you really focus on problem solving and you provide them with all the information they could reasonably have, in theory, as long as you make your problems interesting, they will work out a way around the problem that you as the GM would never imagine. And there is no better feeling than to describe a problem and have the players solve it in a way that you never would have conceived of prior. That is the beauty of shared storytelling, is the, the things that you would never get just in your own head, you know? And and so that's the fundamental philosophy of Cairn and, and, and many NSR games. Yohai has a blog named newschoolrevolution.com. His blog name was inspired by a blog post by Pandatheist on his own blog, Bonebox Chant, called exactly New School Revolution. Here's why. When I read this original post about the New School Revolution, and it essentially listed NSR games as having a couple different features. They are rules light. They um, are highly lethal in that, like, you can die easily as a character. Although that term itself has been somewhat disputed by various people who have either been called NSR or who are maybe part of the OSR but seem to make games that fit more into this category. So letho high lethality, have a GM, and the GM has kind of total arbitration. And then they have a couple other features to them, too. They tend to focus on the weird, you know, like weird fiction and sort of subverting common tropes, especially within fantasy. I describe it like this. Uh, the NSR is old school role-playing games, like recently designed OSR games in the old school spirit, whatever you want to call them, that don't pay allegiance to old school mechanics or even um, inspirational sources. And, and, and I think the best way I can describe it is like this. I read a lot of blogs, and what I have found is if a blog, even a really good blog like Grognardia, which is amazing that they came back, um, if they reference the experience of running D&D &D in the 80s, I lose interest. Like late 70s, 80s, I don't care. And it's ironic because games like Karen, people have told me like, oh yeah, this really emulates. I, I pay homage to all the thinking that came out of that, and I truly respect some of the like design 
perspectives. The NSR is a way of, for me, is a way of saying, yeah, I really respect what those things did, but I have no connection with the 70s and 80s D&D experience. There is a strong community working around Cairn, making hacks and modules, localizations of the project. The Italian translation is completed. French and Portuguese are almost finished. And maybe by the time you listen to this podcast, they will be over. The project keeps growing and Yohai keeps releasing all the material for free and under a Creative Commons license. Everything I do is free. It's not pay what you want. It's free. Except for, you know, paying for these damn books. But... Everything that I make is free of charge. And hopefully that will always be true unless I, you know, pay an artist to do something. Then I'm going to probably give them all the money from it. I, I don't do this for money. And I'm lucky enough to have a job that pays me enough that I can do these things. So I have no judgment on people who charge for RPGs. I think that's fantastic. I think you should make a living out of it if you can. But I'm not trying to. I'm just trying to make a game that works for me that hopefully people can make even better. You know, if someone takes it and goes, hey, I want to make a better version of this, that is no better compliment to me. And um, um, I feel, you know, privileged to share what I have. And if people can improve it, great. If they can't, I don't care. Do whatever the hell you want, you know. And I, I, honestly, I took from two games that, to make 90% of the material in here. Yeah, I wrote about it in my own words. But even that wasn't necessarily true because... Um, the original skeleton of the whole thing was Jim Parkin's Weird North, where I was an editor for that. And I, and I did edit it heavily. Like the principles that are in this book started with Weird North. By the way, my payment for Weird North was that he would make it Creative Commons license. That's what I told him. I said, I will edit this thing for you and I will spend time on it if you make the text Creative Commons license. And he said, sure. I convinced him to make a Creative Commons license, and then I took that as a kind of, you know, s uh, skeleton of what I have here, and I ripped it out and changed things, and 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 added a another Creative Commons licensed game, Nave, as the fundamental character generation system, as the inventory system, which is frankly what makes it work. In essence, none of these ideas are mine. None of them. I just read good ideas and thought this would work in a system I would want to play in. And then I put them together and the result is a game people want to play, which is amazing, you know, because it, it does fill one niche, which is if you like rules like games like Nave and Into the Odd, but you want it to be, um, you want to run old school modules, here's, that's it. This is the game to use. So I'm working on two things right now. One is a bestiary, which I recently learned how to pronounce, which is basically just a, a list of monsters. Uh, it's going to be illustrated by Perplexing Runes. He's a terrific artist. And then I'm working on a campaign. The theme is Eastern European Jewish folklore with a little bit of Jewish Middle Eastern influence too. One of the creatures that I um, was really excited to learn about is um, uh, estries or strix in French. Um, which I had heard of before, but didn't know that they had a Jewish roots. And then when I kind of learned more about it, they're really interesting. You know, they're, they're basically vampire women who turn into owls. And so I built an entire scenario around um, estries. And um, it's called the parliament, because that's what a group of owls is called in English, is a parliament, which I think is amazing. Uh, so that's an example of like looking at kind of um, either familiar or unfamiliar Jewish folklore and uh, applying it to this forest fantasy concept that you have in Cairn. Um, I just have these different um, concepts that I want to explore in my own background that I, I want to find a way to present non-standard fantasy that still feels familiar, but at the same time, um, teaches people about uh, other cultures because, you know, um, the more people we get involved in this, you know, the more accessible it is, the more um, different kinds of peoples we have in uh, the role-playing space that I think the stronger we'll be. And, and if I and if I had to make like a semi-political statement, that's what it would be is just, 
I, I'm not saying I'm focused solely on identity. Um, I'm actually not that interested in it outside of the selfish reasons. I just think it makes us, I just think it makes things more interesting. You know, I, the real world is full of more interesting shit than anything we can imagine. So yeah. That was your high gal, designer and creator of Cairn, a rules light forest fantasy role-playing game. You can buy the Cairn book or download it in PDF. I'll put the links in the show notes and on the Lost Bay blog. Yohai has a great blog, newschoolrenaissance.com. Be sure to check it. The Lost Bay is a podcast about indie RPG creators and artists and what's behind their creative processes. It's produced by me, Iko. The editing is by Laura Erle. And music is by Avery Isles. Thanks a lot for listening.